everyone, it's Angela with Broadhead Memorial Public Library back with another episode of Have You Heard? We are still reading Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien with illustrations by Zena Bernstein. We want to make sure we thank Athenium Books for Young Readers for allowing us to share this story with you this summer. Uh, if you are enjoying these stories, make sure you like the videos and you can also subscribe to our channel and you'll be alerted when we post more. Okay, to recap yesterday, we have been learning about Nicodemus's uh, time in the laboratory. And yesterday we found out about the rats um, and how they were getting smarter. And also at the very end, we found out that the laboratory had mice that were almost as smart as the rats. All right, let's see what happens next. The next chapter is called A Lesson in Reading. Of course, Justin did not escape, escape that day, n nor even that year when they, Julie put on a glove and went to pick him up. He submitted meekly enough, and in a short time he was back in his cage. Yet he had learned some things. He had, as Julie noticed, examined the air ducts, the openings along the wall through which warm air flowed in the winter, cool air in the summer, and he had studied the windows. Mainly he had learned that he could, occasionally at least, jump from his cage and wander around without incurring any injury, any anger or energy or excuse me any anger or injury all of this eventually was important for it was justin along with jenner who finally figured out how to get away i had a part in it too but all that but all that came later i won't go into details about the rest of our training except for one part of it that was the most useful of all but in general during the months that followed two things were happening First, we were learning more than any rats had ever learned before, and we were becoming more intelligent than any rats had ever been. The second thing could be considered, from some points of view, even more important, and certainly more astonishing than the first. Dr. Schultz, you will recall, had said that a new series of injections might increase our lifespan by double or more, yet even he was not prepared for what happened. Perhaps it was the odd combination of both types of injections working together. I don't know, and neither did he. But the result was that as far as he could detect, in the A group, the aging process seemed to stop almost completely. For example, during the years we were in the laboratory, most of the rats in the control group grew old and sickly and finally died. So did those in the B group. For though they were getting injections too, the formula was not the same as ours. But among the 20 of us in A group, no one could see any signs that we were growing older at all. Apparently, though we seldom saw them, the same thing was happening with the G group, the mice who were getting the same inject injections we were. Dr. Schultz was greatly excited about this. The short lifespan has always been a prime limiting factor in education, he told George and Julie. If we can double it and speed up the learning process at the same time, the possibilities are enormous. Double it, even now, years later, years after the injections were stopped, we seem scarcely any older than we were then. We could not detect either of these things ourselves. That is, we didn't feel any different, and since we had no contact with the other groups, we had no basis for comparison. All we had to go by was that Dr. Schultz said he and the others were preparing a research paper about us to be published in some scientific journal. So each morning he dictated the results of the previous day's tests into a tape recorder. We heard all of it, though there was a lot of technical stuff we couldn't understand, especially at first. Until the paper was published, he kept reminding George and Julie of this, the whole experiment was to be kept secret. The one important phase of training began one day after weeks of really hard work at the shape recognition that I mentioned before. But this was different. For the first time they used sounds along with the shapes and pictures, real pictures we could recognize. 
For example, one of the first and simplest of these exercises was a picture, a clear photograph of a rat. I suppose they felt sure we would know what that was. This picture was shown on a screen with a light behind it. Then, after I had looked at the picture and recognized it, a shape flashed on the screen under it, a sort of half circle and two straight lines, not like anything I had seen before. Then the voices began, R, R, R. It was Julie's voice, speaking very clearly, but it had a tinny sound. It was a recording. After repeating R a dozen times or so, that particular shape disappeared, and another one came on the screen, still under the picture of a rat. It was a triangle with legs on it, and Julie's voice began again. A, A, A. When that shape disappeared, a third, voice, a third one came on the screen. This one was a cross. Julie's voice said, T, T, T. Then all three shapes appeared at once, and the record said, R, A, T, Rat. You will already have recognized what was going on. They were teaching us to read. The symbols under the pictures were the letters R-A-T, but the idea did not become clear to me, nor any of us, for quite a long time, because, of course, we didn't know what reading was. Oh, we learned to recognize the shapes easily enough, and when I saw the rat picture, I knew straight away what symbols would appear beneath it. In the same way, when the picture showed a cat, I knew the same shapes would appear, except the first one would be a half circle, and Julie's voice would repeat, C, C, C. I even learned that when the photograph showed not one, but several rats, the f a fourth shape would appear under it, a snaky line, and the sound, and the sound with the that one was S, S, S. But as to what all this was for, none of us had any inkling. It was Jenner who finally figured it out. By this time, we had developed a sort of system of communication, a simple enough thing, just passing spoken messages from one cage to the next, like passing notes in school. Justin, who was still next to me, called to me one day. Message for Nicodermus from Jenner. He says important. All right, I said, what's the message? Look at the shapes on the wall next to the door. He said to look carefully. My cage, like Jenner's and those of the rat, the rest of A group, was close enough to the door so that we could see what he meant. Near the doorway, there was a large square piece of white cardboard fastened to the wall, a sign. It was covered with an assortment of black markings to which I had never paid any attention, though they had been there ever since we arrived. Now, for the first time, I looked at them carefully, and I grasped what Jenner had discovered. The top line of black marks on the wall were instantly familiar, R-A-T-S. As soon as I saw them, I thought of the picture that went with them, and as soon as I did that, I was, for the first time, reading. Because, of course, that's what reading is, using symbols to suggest a picture or an idea. From that time on, it gradually became clear to me that all these lessons were for, were for and once I understood the idea, I was eager to learn more. I could scarcely wait for the next lesson, and the next. The whole concept of reading was, to me, at least, to me, at the least fascinating. I remember how proud I was when, months later, I was able to read and understand the whole sign. I read it hundreds of times, and I'll never forget it. Rats may not be removed from the laboratory without written permission, and at the bottom in small letters, the word NIM. But then a puzzling thing came up, a thing we're still not sure about even now. Apparently, Dr. Schultz, who was running the lessons, did not realize how well they were succeeding. He continued the training with new words and new pictures every day. But the fact is, once we had grasped the idea and learned the different sounds each letter stood for, we leaped way ahead of him. I remember well during one of the lessons looking at the picture of a tree. Under it, the letters flashed on T-R-E-E. -E. But in the photograph, though the, the tree was in the foreground, there was a building in the background and a sign near it. 
I scarcely glanced at the tree, but concentrated instead on reading the sign. It said, NIM, private parking by permit only, reserved for doctors and staff, no visitor parking. The building behind it, tall and white, looked very much like the building we were in. I'm sure Dr. Schultz had plans for testing our reading ability. I could even guess from the words he was teaching us that the tests were going to be like, for example, he taught us left, right, door, food, open, and so on. It was not hard to imagine the test. I would be placed in one chamber, my food in another. There would be two doors and the sign saying, for food, open door at right, or something like that. Then, if I, if all of us moved unerringly toward the proper door, he would know we understood the sign. As I said, I'm sure he planned to do this, but apparently he did not think we were ready for it yet. I think maybe even he was a little afraid to try it, because if he did it too soon, or if for any other reason it did not work, his experiment would be a failure. He wanted to be sure, and his caution was his undoing. Justin announced one evening around the partition, I'm going to get out of my cage tonight and wander around a bit. How can you? It's locked. Yes, but did you notice along the bottom edge there's a printed strip? I had not noticed it. I should perhaps explain that when Dr. Schultz and the others opened our cages, we could never quite see how they did it. They manipulated something under the plastic floor, something we couldn't see. What does it say? I've been trying to read it the last three times they brought me back from training. It's very small print, but I think I finally made it out. It says, to release door, pull knob forward and slide right. Knob? Under the floor, about an inch back, there's a metal thing just in front of the shelf. I think that's the knob, and I think I can reach it through the wire. Anyway, I'm going to try. Now? Not until they close up. Closing up was a... Closing up was a ritual Dr. Schultz, George, and Julie went through each night. For about an hour, they sat at their desks, wrote notes in books, filed papers in cabinets, and finally locked the cabinets. Then they checked all the cages, dimmed the lights, locked the doors, and went home, leaving us alone in the still laboratory. About half an hour after they left that night, Justin said, I'm going to try now. I heard a scuffling noise, a click and a scrape of metal and in a matter of seconds, I saw his door swing open. It was as simple as that, when you could read. Wait, I said, what's the matter? If you jump down, you won't be able to get back in. The, then they'll know. I thought of that. I'm not going to jump down. I'm going to climb up the outside of the cage. It's easy. I've, been, I've climbed up the inside a thousand times. Above these cages, there's another shelf and it's empty. I'm going to walk along there and see what I can see. I think there's a way to climb up to the climb to the floor and up again. Why don't I go with you? My door would open the same way as his. Better not this time, don't you think? If something goes wrong and I can't get back, they'll say it's just A9 again. But two of us but if two of us are found outside, they'll take it seriously. They might put new locks on our cages. He was right. And you can see that already we both had the same idea in mind. This might be the first step towards an escape for all of us. All right, the next chapter is called The Air Ducks. And so it was. By teaching us how to read, they had taught us how to get away. Justin climbed easily up the open door of his cage and vanished over the top with a flick of his tail. He came back an hour later, greatly excited and full of information. Yet it was typical of Justin that even, ex that even excited as he was, he stayed calm. He thought clearly. He climbed down the front of my cage rather than his own and spoke softly. We both assumed that by now the other rats were asleep. Nicodemus, come on out. I'll show you how. He directed me as I reached through the wire bars of the door and felt beneath it. I found the small metal knob and slid it forward and sideways and felt the door swing loose against my shoulder. I followed him up to the side of the cage to the shelf above. There we stopped. It was the first time I had met Justin face to face. He said, it's better talking here than around the partition. Yes. Did you get down? Yes. How did you get back up? At the end of this shelf, there's a big cabinet. They keep the mouse cages in it. It has wire mesh doors. You can climb up and down them like a ladder. Of course, I said, I remember now. 
I had seen that cabinet many times when my cage was carried past it. For some reason, perhaps because they were smaller, the mice were kept in cages within a cage. Justin said, Nicodemus, I think I've found a way to get out. You have? How? At each end of the room, there's an opening in the baseboards at the bottom of the wall. Air blows in through one of them and out the other. Each one has a metal grid covering it, and on the grid there's a sign that says, Lift to adjust airflow. I lifted one of them. It hangs on hinges like a trap door. A mouse just ran through my patio. Do you think they're listening? All right, I have to find my spot again. I lifted one of them. It hangs on hinges like a trap door. Behind it, there is a thing like a metal window. When you slide it wide open, more air blows in. But the main thing is, it's easy, easily big enough to walk through and get out. But what's on the other side? Where does it lead? On the other side, there's a duct, a thing like a square metal pipe built right into the wall. I walked along it, not very far, but I can figure out where it must go. There's bound to be a duct like it leading to every room in the building, and they must all branch off one main central pipe, and that has to lead somewhere to the outside, because that's where our air comes from. That's why they never open the windows. I don't think those windows can open. He was right, of course. The building had central air conditioning. What we had to do was to find the main air shaft and explore it. There would have to be an intake at one end and an outlet at another, but that was easier said than done, and before it was done there were questions to be answered. What about the rest of the rats? There were twenty of us in the laboratory, and we had to let the others know. So one by one we woke them and showed them how to open their cages. It was an odd assembly that gathered that night under the dim lights in the echoing laboratory on the shelf where Justin and I had talked. We all knew each other in a way from the passing of messages over the preceding months, yet except for Jenner and me, none of us had really ever met. We were strangers, though as you can imagine, it did not take long for us to develop a feeling of com comradeship, for we twenty were alone in a strange world. Just how alone and how strange, none of us really understood at first, yet in a way we sensed it from the beginning. The group looked to me as leader, probably because it was Justin and I who first set them free, and because Justin was obviously younger than I was. We did not attempt to leave that night, but went together and looked at the metal grid Justin had discovered and made plans for exploring the air ducts. Jenner was astute at that sort of thing. He could foresee problems. With a vent like this leading to every room, he said, it'll be easy to get lost. When we explore, we're going to need some way of finding our way back here. Why should we come back? Someone asked. Because it may take more than one night to find a way out. If it does, whoever's, going, whoever's doing the exploring must be back in his cage by morning. Otherwise, Dr. Schultz will find out. Jenner was right. It took us about a week. What we did, after some more discussion, was to find some equipment. First, a large spool of thread in one of the cabinets where some of us had seen Julie place it one day. Second, a screwdriver that was kept in the shelf near the electric equipment, because, as Jenner pointed out, there would probably be a screw over the end of the air shaft to keep out debris, and we might have to pry it loose. What we really needed was light, for the ducks at night were completely dark. But there was none to be had, not even a box of matches. The thread and the screwdriver we hid in the duct, a few feet from the entrance. We could only hope we would not be missed, or that if we could only hope they would not be missed, or that if they were, we wouldn't be suspected. Justin and the two others were chosen as the exploration party. One of the others was Arthur, who you've met. They had a terrible time at first. Here was a maze to end all mazes, and in the dark they quickly lost their sense of direction. Still, they kept at it night after night, exploring the network of shafts that laced the like a cubicle spider web through the walls and ceilings of the building. They would tie the end of their thread to the grid in our laboratory and unroll it from the spool as they went. Time and time again they reached the end of the thread and had to come back. It just isn't long enough. Justin would complain. Every time I come to the end, I think, if I could just go ten feet further. 
And finally, that's what he did. On the seventh night, just as the thread ran out, he and the other two reached a shaft that was wider than any they had found before, and it seemed as they walked along it to be slanting gently upward. But the spool was empty. You wait here, Justin said to the others. I'm going just a little f- way further. Hang on to the spool, and if I call, call back. They had tied the end of the thread around the spool so they would not lose it in the dark. Justin had a hunch. The air coming through the shaft had a fresher smell where they were and seemed to be blowing harder than it had in other shafts. Up ahead, he thought he could hear the whir of a machine running quietly, and there was a faint vibration in the metal under his feet. He went on. The shaft turned upward at a sharp angle, and then straight ahead he saw it a patch of lighter colored darkness than the pitch black around him and in it the middle of it three stars twinkling it was the open sky across the opening there was as jenner had predicted a coarse screen of heavy wire all right we are gonna we're in the middle of the chapter but we are gonna stop there for now um we still have have quite a few more pages left in this chapter so we'll start there um next time all right well if you have been participating in our summer reading program you can go ahead and write down 20 minutes of reading time for today um we will be back more next week with mrs frisby and the rats of nim all right have a great weekend everyone bye